Uh, and that is another fact of life, that big government makes small citizens. To be told you are not free to put a non-elasticated sheet on your bed is not a small loss. It's immense and profound in what it says about state power. Uh, and that is true for the people who regulate our lives, too. I was on the receiving end, uh, not as Rick said, of just the Ontario Human Rights Commission, but of three separate human rights commissions in, in this country. Where do you go to vote out the HRC? Uh, which polling station do you go to to vote out whichever faceless bureaucrat at the RCMP banned that gun the other day? The left loves this stuff because it makes elections less and less important. You have, in a sense, a permanent one-party bureaucratic state in which occasionally a left-wing party will get knocked out of power, but the right-wing party that comes in is basically sitting in the, in the pilot seat of a plane locked on the bureaucracy's automatic pilot. Um, in, uh, in English boys' boarding schools, uh, the, uh, the, the prefects used, used to give the, uh, the, the boys in the first year tuppence halfpenny in those chilly, wintry, unheated uh, schools to go and sit on the toilets and keep the seat warm until the prefect was ready to swan in and assume his rightful position. And, and the Liberal Party of Canada and other left of centre parties around the world understand that that is the basic function of right of centre parties when, when, uh, when the Liberals are knocked out of office. You give the Conservatives tuppence halfpenny to go in and keep the seat of the one-party bureaucratic toilet warm until the left of centre party is ready to resume its, its uh, place again. And it requires tremendous, tremendous determination to do what Jason Kenney uh, and other cabinet ministers have done over the last few years, to take meaningful democratic, accountable control of even a tiny part of the permanent hydra-headed bureaucracy. And as difficult it is, as it is, yes. You know. I, don't, I don't know how many, I don't know how many of his civil servants genuinely like Jason Kenney. But they understand that it's not business as usual. And, to, and it takes tremendous forcefulness to actually take one of those departments and persuade it to rethink its, because they think, ah, Jason Kenney, yeah, he'll be here two, three, four years, then he's gone and some other guy. We, we'll carry on regardless. And it takes tremendous determination to ensure that they don't carry on regardless. And the left is thinking about that permanent bureaucracy the whole time, not just at City Hall, County Hall, Provincial Hall, Dominion Hall, but United Nations Hall. They're thinking of it at a global level. Um, anyone here uh, know who Herman Van Rompuy is? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, you, sir. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You, uh, you win the Honda Civic. Uh, have, a have a word with Preston. It's fully loaded and it'll be waiting for you outside. Um, yeah, he's some Belgian bloke who uh, managed to get himself appointed, quote, President of Europe, uh, whatever that means. Um, he's, he's hardly a household name, even in the uh, Van Rompuy household. He's, uh, I, I don't think Belgian TV has uh, Belgian Idol or Dancing with the Belgians, but, uh, but he'd be knocked out in round one, I think, even if he... he but uh, in his acceptance speech, uh, he... Uh, you know, so he's like, he, got, he basically got lucky. One, one minute he was an obscure Belgian, uh, next minute he was an obscure Belgian with President of Europe printed on his business card. You know, it could happen to anyone. But he declared, in his acceptance speech, he declared, 2009 is the first year of global governance. Did you get that memo? <laughs> you know, if you don't like your local school, you can move to the next town. If you're sick of Quebec taxes, you can move to Saskatchewan. Where do you move to if you don't like global governance? What polling station do you go to to vote that out? So, so the rise of the hyper-regulatory bureaucratic state is an assault on representative government 
and free peoples have to figure out a way to reclaim the right to change their government so that that faceless bureaucrat in the RCMP and all the other regulatory agencies is implementing the will of the people's representatives and not in effect passing new micro laws without the tedious business of having to bring them to parliament. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would say another fact of life, the most consequential act of state ownership in the late 20th century Western world was not the nationalization of airlines or the nationalization of railways or the nationalization of healthcare, uh, but the nationalization of the family. Um, I owe that, that phrase to Professor uh, Vadyanayathan at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, which I, uh, Tana mentioned a few minutes ago. And he, like, he's a bit of a chippy post-imperialist, and he's nobody's idea of a right-winger. But he's absolutely uh, right about this. It's the defining idea of our times. Uh, once upon a time, ambitious leftists wanted to take control of the controlling heights of the economy. Uh, steel, coal, cars, planes, banks, but it was such a disaster uh, that it's been more or less abandoned. Uh, and instead, they, they did something which I think is far subtler, which is to embark on the nationalization of the family. Uh, the, the, uh, the West has nationalized families over the last 60 years, writes Professor Vaidya Nathan. Old age, ill health, single motherhood, everything is the responsibility of the state. And like any other nationalized industry, the nationalized family prioritizes more and more perks for its beneficiaries, it's unresponsive to market pressure, and it revels in declining productivity. Uh, literally, I mean, the biggest structural defect, which again has been tangentially touched on here, the biggest structural defect in the Western world is its deathbed demography, the upside-down family tree. In Greece, four grandparents of two children have one grandchild. So the problem in Greece isn't fiscal. It's not an accounting issue. It's not a budget issue. It's way beyond that. Is it likely that 42 grandchildren are going to pay off the debts run up by 100 grandparents? Everybody knows the answer to that. Uh, the nationalized family doesn't save. Uh, Canada, for example, I said it had significantly lower levels of government debt than many other countries, but it has unhealthy levels of personal debt. Um, why should the nationalized family save? When the state pays for your retirement and your kids and your aged parents and your health care, what's to save for? You know, Edmund Burke talked about the little platoons. I've heard it quoted a couple of times at panels uh, around here the last couple of days. And Alexis de Tocqueville put it slightly differently, that what matters are the mediating institutions between the citizen and the sovereign, uh, local government, churches, charities, civic institutions, too many of which have been hacked away over the last uh, two or three generations. But the most basic societal building block of all is the family. And another fact of life to that is that the great evil of welfare is not that it's a waste of money, but that it's a waste of people. When you have transgenerational, uh, uh, multi-generational welfare, when you have families where, where people don't work, where nobody has any memories of people working, and that goes on to two, three, four generations. That's the most appalling waste of people's lives. And that, that, that waste of lives is, is far more critical and, and, and a far worse evil than simply the waste of money involved. Uh, and I would say, uh, as a, as a final thought, uh, that this is the most important fact of all. Culture trumps politics. Once every, uh, once every few years, you can persuade the electorate to go out and vote for a conservative party. But if you want them to vote for conservative government, you have to do the hard work of shifting the culture every day, seven days a week, in all the years between elections. Because if the culture's liberal, if the schools are liberal, if the churches are liberal, if the hip, fashionable business elite is liberal, if the guys who make the movies and the pop songs are liberal, then electing a conservative ministry uh, isn't going to make a lot of difference. And, no, and nor should it, because in a free society, politics is the art of the possible. And if you want to make more things possible, you need to lay all the groundwork 
in the period between elections. Su Susan Delacourt said uh, just uh, before I came on, about an hour ago, uh, that the thing about the, uh, the Conservative Party is that by the time the election campaign is launched, they've already fought the election campaign. In other words, they've done it before the campaign officially begins. Uh, and that's another line of Mrs. Thatcher's. First, first you win the argument, then you win the election. But you don't, you don't think about it just in terms of what you need to move the meter this way in this or that swing riding. Uh, you, you need, in, in terms of what you're able to do in government, in terms of making sure that you're not merely in office, but in power and able to affect change, uh, you have to be able to do that work in a f more profound sense. Winning the election is one day. Winning the argument is every day. 